Amen. Good morning, Cross Point Church. How many of you are thankful for Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. I love that response. Boy, I tell you, that's good. Uh, I tell you, before we get started, I just want to say uh, a big thank you to Jordan and our worship team this morning. I tell you, they do an incredible job each and every week, and so can we just thank them this morning for an amazing time of worship. As, uh, I tell you, God is really moving in a lot of ways, and one of the ways that we've recognized God moving is not only in the lives of individuals. You know, we see every week, we hear stories of how God has, has changed somebody's life or how God has just really just come to somebody's rescue or just a whole host of different things that God is doing in the life of people, but God is also stirring in our ministries, and uh, I love that, how God will work with a group of people who's doing an incredible job to, to serve uh, our church and to, to just be a part of, of what God's doing here, you know, from our children's ministry to, to our hospitality ministry, our security team. There's so many different ways that, that people are serving, but in, that, in those ways, God's moving, and, and so one of the things I'm just very thankful for is, is uh, the efforts and the... the the work that goes into our worship ministry and, and those guys all being committed to uh, just doing their part for the glory of God. And, they, and every week they come up here and make much of Jesus, amen? And, and I don't know about you, but it just it, it really gets me excited about uh, the week ahead and, and just to be able to worship God in, in just a, an amazing way. And so I just am really thankful for Jordan and the teams uh, that come up here each and every week. So this morning we're gonna be kicking off a new series called Trusting God with the Impossible. And so uh, I, I tell you, it's, it's really, uh, I, I'm very excited about this series. And I'll tell you why I'm excited. I, I'm excited about every series, okay? I, I get that. I know I even tell you that. In fact, I probably tell you I'm excited every week, and that's not a lie. I mean, I'm genuinely excited every, each and every week just to see your smiling faces. And even those of you who have a frown on your face right now, I'm glad you're here too, you know? Uh, but uh, it, it, it's exciting because... We are gathered in this place to worship God and, and also to hear from God. And, and I just, I love the fact that God just does so much in, the, in, in our series as we walk through God's word, how he engages in the hearts and the minds of, of those of us that are here and, and how he teaches us so much and he shows us so much about who he is and reveals so much about himself to us. And, and, and so it's, it, it's always an exciting time for me. It's always a, a really good time. But, but this series that we're about to start into today, this, this one that we're calling Trusting God with the Impossible, it's going to be a series where we have an opportunity to walk through the book of Exodus. Uh, it's only four weeks long, so it won't be the whole book, uh, but it'll be key passages in that book. And, uh, and, and here's the thing that I'm really praying for, and I, and I hope you'll join me in praying for this as well, but I'm praying for revival to take place in our, in our church. You know, revival, amen. Revival is not something that we can set a date for and say, hey, guess what? God's going to show up. He's going to bring revival. You need to be here. Uh, revival is something that is all in God's hands, but I, I, I'm praying, and I want to ask you to join me in prayer as well, that God would just bring revival to our hearts. I tell you what, uh, a revival in our hearts is not something that is just for the weak of faith. It, it's, it's for all of us, you know, and, uh, and I, I just pray that God would just move, continue to just do his transformative work in our life uh, and, and that he would just do something really special. I believe that this series, these four weeks, has the opportunity of being the prelude to the next series that we have coming up, which is called, where we're going to be looking at the faithfulness of God. How many of you believe that God is faithful in your life? Amen? Amen. You know, here, here's the thing. I hope that that's not just a, a general response from a question, okay? I hope that deep down inside, you truly believe that God is faithful. Uh, we need God to be faithful, amen? We need him to be faithful, and he is faithful. The very nature of who he is is faithfulness. And so we're going to be uh, talking about that after this series, but we're talking about uh, trusting God and trusting God with the impossible. And I believe this series is going to be a bit of a prelude to uh, the next series as well. And I'm just praying for God's spirit to come and move among us and to just really transform who we are as followers of Christ Jesus. And I believe, I, I know he can, uh, and, and I, I believe he wants to. And I believe that uh, we need to be faithful in praying and asking for that in our life as well. Before we move into a time of prayer this morning, I do want to mention 
that this weekend, and I mean it just happened uh, Saturday afternoon and then Sunday morning, we've had two mass shootings in our, in our country. And so I want to invite you to uh, just really a time of corporate prayer where we come together and we lift up uh, uh, a lot of families that are hurt uh, by these shootings that have taken place. I mean, you may not have even heard about them. They're so recent. Uh, they happened literally one in Dayton, Ohio, literally happened early this morning. And so uh, a lot of people have lost their life. A lot of people are injured and in the hospital. But here's what I know, especially in light of the message that we're going to be looking at today, there's a lot of people that are hurting and uncertain about the future right now. There, there are families who lost loved ones, who lost children. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a, a lot of hurt that's happening right now in our own country. And oftentimes when we hear these things in the news, uh, you know, we think of them as being so far away and, you know, but the l very least that we can do is lift up uh, those families here this morning. So let's celebrate what God's doing in our life and what he can do in this place and even pray for revival, but let us also remember the families that are hurting today. So let's pray together this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, Lord, we do thank you for this day. And God, we thank you for the great things that you're doing in our midst. And God, how we celebrate your goodness. And Father, how you're moving in such a way that it is very exciting to, to hear testimony each and every week about how you're transforming lives is just too much to, to really take in sometimes, God. It's amazing to see how, how you're working. And, and Father, as we think about all of that, Lord, we also pray that you would just do a transformative work in our own hearts and our own minds, God. Continue to do what you do best by changing lives, God, and drawing men and women unto yourself. And I pray, Father, too, that, Lord, as we think about these things, that we would, we would be praying for revival to really take place in our life, but also, God, an awakening to take place in our community. God, we pray for people to get saved. We pray, God, for people to come to know Jesus Christ as their hope. God, we pray for those people that we've already identified as our one. God, we pray for those that we would be called to go and share the good news of Christ with. God, that you, you would just... Do what you do best, and that is to draw men and women unto yourself to salvation. God, we love you so much. And Lord, we remember also these families here this morning that have been affected by these terrible tragedies that we've heard in the news this morning. God, there are families right now, people just like us, that have lost loved ones, God, to tragic events in our world. God, we recognize that there are horrible people in this world that just do things that are unimaginable. But God, I pray, God, for these families. I pray, Father, that you would move in such a way that, that Lord, these lives would be able to find, uh, these people would be able to find the, the hope that is found in Christ Jesus. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And all of God's people said amen. Amen. You know, every one of us in this room, at some point in our life, will, uh, will encounter problems that seem almost impossible to handle on our own. And in fact, they probably are. Uh, there, there's problems that we face, situations and circumstances in our life that no matter how hard we try, no matter how much effort we put into it, they're just impossible for us to overcome. And even when we go to our friends and our family and our pastors and our life group leaders and we turn to them to, to seek help, Oftentimes, these things are just completely out of the realm of us doing anything about them. And these situations, maybe you're sitting here today, you say, well, I've never experienced anything like that. And I would say to you, well, praise God. Uh, praise God that you haven't. I've been in those situations, and I know many people who have been in those situations. And I would just say to you, I guess, as a bit of a warning that just get ready, it could happen to you as well. I think about the families that are dealing with the, 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 uh, the mass shooting here this morning. I'm certain that those families never thought that would happen to them in their life. And now, in their grief and in their hurt and their pain and the wounds that they feel, they are wondering how they're going to overcome the hurt in their life. And many of them think right now in this moment that there's no way they ever can. Those are the kind of situations we often face in life. And these situations, they affect us in a lot of different ways. 
They affect us emotionally. Many times in these situations, we just simply lose our mind over the situations that we're facing. And, 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 and it just it, we feel so vulnerable and so weak and so helpless and so hopeless in these, in these moments that, that in our emotions, our emotions just run wild. Sometimes anger is at the forefront of what we feel. And sometimes, sometimes sadness is there. And, and sometimes we are just hurting so deeply, we don't even know what we're thinking. Oftentimes these circumstances can affect us physically. I mean, I, I've seen people that are going through such dark circumstances in their life that they are just literally physically ill because of the situations that they face. They affect us spiritually. They affect us financially. Oftentimes these situations are very relational as well. And in those relationships we see that, 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 that are just seemingly falling apart in front of us and there's nothing we can do to, to fix the problem. There's nothing we can do to, 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 to take care of the situation that we're facing. And we realize in that moment that we are going to have to push through this, that this is something that is laid out before us and that there's no going around it. It is something we've got to walk cleanly through and it's going to be painful and it's going to be hurtful. And we know that, that people have this amazing ability to hurt us deeply and and so we face these circumstances and they seem impossible for us to get through these types of situations are never easy and they're always hard and they just cause so much pain in our life but it's in these situations that somehow some way we have to lean into and press into our lord and our savior our Father in heaven, and we have to pray, and we have to trust the God of impossibilities. We have to, because we have no choice. There's no one else to turn to. There's no one else to lean into. Everybody we've gone to, uh, they, they just look at us and they go, I'm sorry, I don't know what I can do, but pray. There are moments in our life where we have to trust God for the impossible. This morning, I want to talk about trusting God for the impossible healing that oftentimes we need in our life. And maybe this morning, some of you are sitting here and it's, it's, it's emotional healing that you need in your life. Maybe for some of you this morning, it's physical healing that you need in your life. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's a whole host of different things. It could be spiritual, it could be financial, it could be relational, it could be a whole host of different things. But but I pray that today as we look into God's word that somehow, some way, God would speak into your life and help you to understand that he can be trusted in the midst of these situations. I want to invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to be going to Exodus chapter 2. Now, I realize I'm skipping an entire chapter here, so I won't leave it out. I'll just talk a little bit about it as we prepare to go there. If you're looking for Exodus, it's the second book of the Bible. It follows right behind uh, Genesis. And so uh, we want to go there, and we want to look at this. Um, as, we, as we look at this, this passage, we begin to realize that that uh, Exodus starts off talking about Moses. And in this series, we're going to be walking through the life of Moses and also looking at the life of the Israelites. You know, for the last eight weeks, we spent time looking at the life of Peter, and we learned a lot by just looking at the life of Peter. But now we're going to switch gears, and we're going to go to the Old Testament. We're going to look at these uh, lives. Now, a lot has happened in Egypt over the last uh, long time, uh, last couple of hundred years here. And and, and, and Israel is, is beginning to change, you know, it's, it's beginning to, to be transformed. And a lot of things are happening in Israel now. Uh, Israel is, is under uh, the oppression of the Egyptians. Uh, they are in a place of slavery. They are in a place of servanthood. But it, it's, it's about to get worse. And all of this is out of their control. All of this is out of their hands. But we read passages uh, in, in Israel, I mean, in, in um, Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, uh, verses like this, it says, it, it reveals to us the change that's taking place. It says, but the people of Israel, they were fruitful and they increased greatly. And if you're a little confused about what that means, it means they were having a lot of babies, okay? They were having a lot of babies. They're, they're, they're multiplying in numbers. They are growing in population, if you will. And it says here that they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. And so suddenly you have this situation 
where, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of Egyptians, obviously, in the land of Egypt, but there's also now a lot of Israelites, a lot of the Hebrew people, and so their population had exploded, and, and we're seeing this, this thing happen, and, and as we look at this, and as we read through Exodus chapter 1, we begin to realize, as you can imagine, that this concerned the Egyptians, especially the fact that they were gr growing in strength and population, and the concern would be, certainly, that, hey, hey, and, and before long, they're going to outnumber us, right, and, and this is not going to be good for our country this to be something that 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 may uh you know they may turn against us and so we see this happening this new king or this new pharaoh had come and uh, scripture tell us that he didn't know joseph and i won't get into the life of joseph we just don't have time but but the this pharaoh began to to see this change that was taking place and and, and they were enslaved to israel but uh they begin to really just press harder upon their life and we learn this from exodus chapter 1 13 and 14 it says this said the egyptians it said so they ruthlessly made the people of israel work as slaves and then verse 14 and made their lives bitter with hard service and so here's what's happening i mean they are no longer just indentured servants they are being pressed into hardcore slavery and they're mistreated and they're abused and, and and this is really beginning to weigh heavy upon them and all of this that they are feeling and experiencing is completely out of their control it's a situation where it's just getting worse and worse and if that wasn't bad enough another thing began to happen another thing began to change what we see here is that this new pharaoh he didn't like what he saw and so uh he he begins to do something that had never been happened before he begins to see that there were so many hebrew people there were so many israelites that were that were on the scene now that he soon orders every newborn hebrew male to be killed now, i want you to just wrap your minds around that for a moment most of us in this room and i would say all of us probably have never been in a situation quite as hard as this have we we've never been in a situation where we have been so oppressed that and and beaten and and just forced into to a place of slavery where we are working at the beck and call of others i mean we are we are doing what we have to do just to stay alive as as servants of another nation most of us in this room i would say all of us probably have never been in that situation but we've also never been in a situation where someone would come to us and say listen if you have any children if it's a girl you're fine but if it's a boy he belongs to us because we're going to kill him and i can only imagine how this brought on a whole new wave of emotions and anger and frustration and hurt and just challenging things upon someone. I can only imagine that, that the, the Hebrew people began to feel as though this was a very impossible situation that they were facing. What are they going to do? There's really nothing they can do. They're at the mercy of the greatest army that existed in their time. So what are they going to do? Well, you know, one of the things that we begin to see in Exodus 2 is that though this may have been something that they had never hoped that would happen to them, nothing that they would ever hope that would uh, be a part of their life, uh, we, we, we begin to see that none of this really catches God off guard. What's really amazing about, about God, and we're going to see this in this passage, is that, that he is in control. Even when life feels as though it's out of control, even though life feels as though it's impossible for us to face, even though we may be experiencing the darkest moments of our life, what we see as we read through Scripture is that God is always in control. And we're going to see that as we dive in to this passage here this morning. Now, Moses was born. We, we see that Moses was born in, in Exodus chapter 2. And being a Hebrew male, he should have been killed. He should have been thrown in the river. He should have been dumped like a piece of meat into the river and just allowed to drown. And he would be 
done away with. But you see, Moses' mother just couldn't come to bear with this reality in her life. And so the scriptures tell us that Moses' mother hid him and hid him for three months. Now, I want you to think about that and how challenging that would have been as well. Uh, this past summer, I had, a couple of weeks ago, I had an opportunity to go on vacation. And most of you know that I have four grandchildren, one of which is a newborn. Let me just say this about children. They're not always quiet, especially newborns, right? They get loud when they get hungry, and you know what I mean. I mean, they, there is nothing you can do. You can't get a bottle fixed quite fast enough to keep that baby from crying. I can only imagine that Moses' mother over three months was dealing with something that seemed like an impossible situation as she tried her best to hide Moses from those who were in charge so that her son would not die. And so she's battling this, but it says after three months, she just couldn't do it anymore. There was no way she could keep him safe. And so she devises this plan to make a basket, a basket that is probably would look more like a boat and so she weaves this basket together and she applies tar and pitch to it to make it waterproof and she sets Moses in the basket and she sets him adrift in the river so that maybe he would go down and be found by someone who would maybe take care of him but to get him out of there because she knew that his life was in danger and I can only imagine what a mother would be going through believing that what was best for a child was to let him go and just hope for the best and trust God with the impossible rather than face what he's certainly going to face in Egypt. So this is what she does. She gets Moses' sister to watch, go downstream and just kind of watch and see what happens. We, we want to try to keep up with him as much as we can. And so this is what happens. And wouldn't you know, out of the house comes Pharaoh's daughter who had been very much aware who would have been very much aware of what the law is, the law from the greatest king of the world, who said that a male Hebrew baby shall not live. Read with me, if you will, Exodus chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. It says, Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. And she saw a basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw a child, and behold, the baby was crying, and she took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, that being Moses' sister, saw it, and she said to the Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you. I think this is really interesting. Let me just stop there for a moment. I think this is really interesting. How bold, knowing that the law is that he shall not live, and yet walking up to the Pharaoh's daughter and saying, should I go get someone who can come and help this child live? What boldness, what desperation maybe to try to keep young Moses alive. Now look at what Pharaoh's daughter said because you would suppose that what would happen would be Pharaoh's daughter would say, no, he needs to die. Just dump the basket in the river. Let him become bait for the fish and the crocodiles. But she doesn't. It says here in verse 8, and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And so the girl went and called the child's mother. Now, here's why I believe this passage is so powerful for us to look at here this morning. Here's why I think it's something that is truly important for us to understand. Because in this passage, we see the beginnings of really the greatest reason why we should be able to trust God with the impossible. We see one of the greatest reasons why we should be able to trust God when we face impossible situations. And here's what it is. We see the makings, we see the beginnings of God's sovereign plan. God's sovereign plan. I said earlier a while ago that in these types of moments when everything is out of our control, we look at the situations and we go, this is impossible. There's nothing we can do. 
And in those moments, we oftentimes, as, even as believers and followers of Christ, we move to really dark places where we begin to allow our emotions to get the best of us. We begin to allow our relationships to fall apart. We, we begin to just come apart at the seams, and we don't know how we're ever going to get out of this situation. And what we fail to do is to remember that God is always, always in control. He's always in control. Now, you may not know how this is going to unfold. I may not know how this is going to unfold. This situation may seem impossible to us, but with God, all things are possible. Amen? How many of you believe that truth this morning? That with God, all things are possible. And so what we fail to do in those moments is remember the truth that is revealed to us in Scripture that God is sovereign. He is always in control. Nothing catches God by surprise. And as desperate a situation as this looks like for the Israelites, God is still in charge. He is still in charge. And we begin to see this unfold as we look at this passage. Uh, my friends, here's the thing. The law was to kill him. To, coming down from the greatest king on the planet during their day, it was non-negotiable. Every Hebrew child must die. That was the law. And yet Pharaoh's daughter had pity on this baby. Where do you think she got that from? The pity being placed on her heart. I mean, as easy as it could have been, she could have looked at him and says, just be away with that child. I can't take this kid to my daddy because I already know what my daddy wants to do with him. But she had such a strong conviction to take care of him. And as we look at this, we begin to realize something amazing is happening in the life of Moses. Moses. You know, in the, in the times of darkness, in times where people have hurt us, in times where we fear, in times of uncertainty, in times where we just don't understand what lies ahead and we don't know how we're ever going to handle it, we have to learn to lean on Him. We have to believe. We have to believe and know that God is sovereign and trust Him. And that's probably the hardest part of all of this is trusting God in those moments. In the darkest moment of my life, and I won't go into it, I've already shared it from the, from the stage many times before, given a part of my testimony, but there was a time in my life that was the darkest moment of my life. It was a time when we were, I was really just wallowing in, in, in just self-pity as as, as I was going through the most difficult situation in my life. And it was during this time that I, I found a verse, I read a verse, I'd heard a verse, be this verse before, but I found this verse and I remember just reading through it and it gave me so much hope as to my future. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. And, and many of you know this, many of you memorize it, but I want us to just read this together because I think it is so powerful and it helps us to understand God's sovereign plan in our life, God's sovereign plan in our life. It says this, it says in verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord speaking to Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. How many of us have ever been in a situation in our life where we just wonder if God is even aware of what we're going through? We've all been there. And Jeremiah was no different. Jeremiah was a man who was, as he's facing the struggles in his life, as he's sort of going through life, he's, he's wondering, you know, where's God in all of this? Oftentimes we find ourselves there. And so the Lord responds to Jeremiah and to us as well this morning when he says, for I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah, you may not know the plans, but I know the plans. Jeremiah, you may not be aware of the future, but I'm aware of your future. Jeremiah, you may be going through difficult times, but I have a plan for your life. And so he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Listen to this. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope that then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Please underline that in your Bible here this morning. I will hear you because so often in our life as we lift up our prayers to God, we say, God, are you listening? God, do you care? 
God, are you there? Hello, Lord. I see you working in everybody else's life, but I, I can't. I, it, it seems as though you have abandoned me. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His word promises that truth to us. He hears our prayers. He has a plan, even when we feel as though our life is out of control. You have to believe that. You have to believe that. Why? Because God's word tells us that it is a promise of God. And so we see this being just sort of playing out. God had a plan for Moses' life. God had a plan for Jeremiah's life. God had a plan for my life. And God has a plan for your life. How many of you believe that this morning? Amen? He has a plan for your life. And he hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. So what was this plan that God had for Moses? What well, turns out, Moses becomes one of the most prominent figures in the Old Testament. I mean, see, here's, here's, what, here's what a three-month-old baby doesn't know, that God has remarkable plans for this young, this, this, I started to say young man. He's a baby, right? For this baby's life. God's not done with him. And so God has remarkable plans for this baby's life. And, and, and we begin to see it as we read through Exodus. We begin to see that God would choose Moses to lead, to lead the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, out of this captivity, and, and to the promised land. He wouldn't carry them into the promised land, but he would lead them to the promised land. And so we know that God had chose Moses to accomplish this. And so we see as we read through Exodus that this becomes a reality and this becomes part of God's sovereign plan for Moses' life. It says here in verse 11, it says, One day, I just want to go here for just a moment because I think this is where it all began for, for Moses. He probably still didn't realize it as a, as, a, as, a, as a young man at this point in his life. He probably didn't realize that, that, that God's plan, his sovereign plan for his life was much bigger than Moses himself just like probably a lot of you don't realize that God's plan for your life is much bigger than you. But it is. There's a greater purpose that God has in store for you than just you and just me. But it says one day in verse 11, one day Moses had grown up and he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens. I want you to think about this for just a moment. Because this is where it begins. Here's a man named Moses, been saved by God. God was his rescuer. God was the one who kept him alive and now has called him, or is about to call him into ministry. And it begins with, with this man just walking out and looking at the people and seeing their slavery and seeing this, this life that they're having to experience. And suddenly he is burdened for his people. I don't want to skip over this verse because I think it's so important for us to understand if we're ever going to make a difference in this community, it begins with us having a burden for the lost. It begins with us having a burden for the hurting. It begins for us having a burden for those who are living their life and going through situations in their life where they feel hopeless. And so Moses here, he goes out and he sees the people and we begin to see that things begin to happen. He, he begins to recognize the impossible situation. The, the Israelites were enslaved. They were, they were having to kill their sons. I mean, all kinds of things are happening in their life that is so out of their control and there is nothing that they can do about any of it. And yet... God sees and understands their trials and their pains. And listen to this. He hears their prayers. I want to skip down to the last part of this chapter. And this is where, I don't know about for you, it's all good to me, but I feel like this is something that we can really relate to, and it's something that is really powerful to look at and consider. But in verse 23... Chapter 2, it says this. During those many days, the king of Egypt had died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. 
and their cry for rescue from slavery, it came up to God. And look at this, and God heard their groanings. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel. And look at this, and God knew. I love that. I, I don't know about you, but when I first read that, I was like, and he knew what? What was it he knew? I, I want to know. And then, and then I just realized, he just knows everything. God knew. Is there anything to add behind that? It goes along with this, this truth that God is sovereign, that God knows what he's doing. God's in control. He's the man in charge. He's the one who is leading the way. And God cares for his people. And that's what I really want you to see here this morning is that he cares for his children despite the darkness that was in their life, despite the hardships that they faced, despite the fact that their children were dying, God is still in control and he hears their prayers and it says that the people they turn to God as things just seem to go from bad to worse and he they turn to God and they cried out to God and it says he heard their groanings and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and he saw the people of Israel and God knew everything that is written there about the Israelites can be applied to your own life. Every bit of it. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, here, here we have the story, a beautiful story about the Israelites. And we see that God cares for his children. Let me, let me just say this. I think this is so interesting. I think it's so interesting. It just... Just go back just a moment. I know this causes us to be in here a little bit longer, but I don't care. <laughs> you might. I don't care. But here's the thing. Go back for just a moment where it says in the passage that it, it says here, it says that the Pharaoh's daughter, look at this, the Pharaoh's daughter, it says, she said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. You know what's so powerful about that to me? That when she stood there holding Moses, she identified him as one of the Hebrews' children, but what she didn't realize that she was holding in her hand was a child of God. It wasn't just a Hebrew. It wasn't just a Hebrew baby. It was the child of God that she had rescued, she had pulled out of the water, that she had pity on, that she was going to eventually save, and not only that, but bring him into the Pharaoh's house. This was a Hebrew child that, that she had, had rescued, and she was standing there holding this little baby, and all she could identify it as is a, is a Hebrew child, but what it was was a, a child of God. And what she didn't realize that day when she, was, when she was rescuing Moses is that she wasn't simply just rescuing one Hebrew baby. She was rescuing the Hebrew nation. Because, you see, God would call Moses to come and deliver his people. And what we begin to realize is that Moses is a type. He's a, he's a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ did for us. You see what I'm saying? This is just, this is just the preliminaries here. You see, the, the scriptures tell us that God so loved the world that he would send his son to die on the cross for my sin and for your sin. He would come and he would die on that cross. He would go and be buried in a borrowed tomb. But in three days, he would have victory over death. Therefore, being able to deliver his children from sin and death. And I don't know about you this morning. I pray that that includes you. I pray. How many of you celebrate this morning being a child of God? Amen. You see, what was happening here was much greater than anybody probably realized. This is, this is like she found a puppy, okay? She didn't find a puppy. She found the child of God. She found God's chosen man to deliver the Hebrew nation out of Egypt. I look at this passage, man, it just, it just fires me up to just think about all of this. I want to show you a few more passages. Because some of you are probably here today saying that this is like, you know, this is a beautiful story, but, but what about me? Uh, turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 1 for just a moment. John chapter 1 in the New Testament, starting with verse 9, it says this. It says, true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. You know who it's talking about here, right? He's talking about Jesus. 
He's saying true light is coming. Jesus is coming into the world. He says true light is coming, was coming into the world. In verse 10 it says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, that is the Hebrew nation, and his own people did not receive him, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There it is right there. Children of God. Children of God. 1 John 3, 1, and the first part of, uh, of 3, 1, it says this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And I love this part. And so we are. As God has poured out on your life his unending love and grace upon your life and you have received that, that grace and that love through Christ Jesus the Lord. You have been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. You've been saved from the wrath of your sin. You've been saved by the atoning work of the blood of Jesus. You have been saved and you are no longer who you used to be. In fact, the scriptures tell us that if you have received, if you have embraced the, the love and grace of God through Christ Jesus, you have been renamed. Let me tell you how that applies. You see, some of you, and we're really good at this, some of us are really good at just thinking about our circumstances, and as we do, we sort of embrace these names that don't belong. We go through these situations in our life where our whole world seems to collapse and we, we embrace the name failure. I'm nothing but a failure. I, I can't tell you how many people, how many believers in Christ Jesus have come to me and said, I just feel like the biggest failure. I'm just, I, my life is destroyed. I, I, I'm, I'm a loser. Well, can I tell you here this morning, that is not the name Jesus Christ has given you. The name that he has given you is child of God. That's the name he's given you. We come in here and we say, my, my name is misery. Woe is me and everything that I do. It just, I, I, I just can't seem to get past this, this miry pit that is just weighing me down. I can't seem to get out of it. Woe is me. My name is misery. That's not the name Jesus Christ gave you. It's not the name he gave you. We've got to learn to trust God in the dark times. Let me just say this. It's easy. Anybody can trust God in the good times. But can you trust God in the dark times? Some translations in 1 John 3 says, see what, the kind of, see what kind of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called, new name, children of God. So why is it that we can't trust God? Why do we find it so hard? I think a lot of it is how we view God, how we see God. What the scriptures point to is that God is a loving God. He is a gracious God. He is a forgiving God. All of these things. He is our rescue and our redeemer. And I think so often the problem that exists in our life is that we just don't view God the way we should be viewing God. A.W. Tozer once said this. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So what pops in your mind when you think of God? dark times I pray that what pops in your mind is rescuer I pray that what pops in your mind is redeemer I pray that what pops in your mind is everlasting father 
Prince of Peace. That's what I pray for you. 1 John 1 9 says this if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning, in just a moment, our band's going to come out and they're going to lead us in a, in a time of worship. In fact, we're going to sing that last song that we sang one, uh, again because it's just so powerful. I just think it's, it's, what we, it's what we need to hear this morning. I think it's just so powerful. I'm so glad that Jordan and the worship team just saw it upon themselves to just come out and lead us in that song again. But let me just say this this morning. Some of you are here today and you're just wondering about this new name, Child of God. You probably needed to hear it really bad. Some of you walked in this place this morning and there are more questions and there are answers in your life right now. Some of you walked into this place and you've heard an awful lot about Jesus but you don't really know him. Some of you walked into this place this morning and you grew up in church all your life and you're just now beginning to realize that there's no relationship. There's no understanding. There's no belief in the promises of God. Some of you have bought into religion and never understood who Jesus really was. In just a moment, our band's going to come out. They're going to sing. And I just want to tell you this morning, and this comes from a pastor who just loves you so much. I just want to share with you this morning, there is an altar here. If you have business to do with God, if you, if you want to approach the throne of God and just say, God, I recognize you as a loving father, as my rescuer. I need you in my life more than I need everything else in my life. Then this altar is for you to come and just spend time with God. If you need to come to one of us as pastors, I'm down front. I'll be here on the front row. I know Pastor Ross is over here. He'll be glad to talk to you. Maybe you came with a friend or a family member or you see your life group leader sitting around you somewhere. Don't leave today without believing and trusting and knowing the promises that God has made. Not only to the Israelites, not only to your pastor, but to you. God is good. And he is waiting for you.